So a lot of what we've talked about so far has been external. So what we need to do is we need to talk a little bit about the internal form and function of the animals. Now when you get into lab, I had mentioned in class at the end of third quarter that you're going to have one day, maybe two days um, at the most in lab. And what we do is we really don't get into the um, internal anatomy in this particular class of, of animals. We're going to stick primarily with the external. So a lot of the information you'll need for the um, summative assessment is going to come from this PowerPoint. Now when you look at the digestive system of these animals, um, you're going to notice they have a foregut, they have a midgut, and they have a hindgut. So that's kind of an easy way to sort of um, think about the positioning of their digestive system. Um, the foregut is going to take into account the mouth and in that mouth you're going to have salivary glands and you're going to have the esophagus, you're going to have the crop, and you're going to have the gizzard. So down here towards the bottom you can see the mouth right here, you can see the um, salivary gland right here, and you can see the crop right there, and the gizzard itself, looking at this diagram, looks like it's probably not being identified here. But it does mention the gastric cecae, which is kind of the transition between the foregut and the midgut, which is identified right here. In the midgut, this is going to be the area that once the food makes it here, is going to be the primary site of digestion, which means breaking down the food, of course, and the absorption of that food. Now the hindgut, which is going to be towards the end, is going to be the primary site for water absorption. And a large number of these insects will actually feed on plant tissues or juices and will be considered herbivores. There's going to be a lot of water absorption that occurs through that type of feeding behavior. Now, earlier on in the screencast, we had talked about a variety of mouth parts. We had mentioned the labium, we had talked about the labrum, the maxillae, we had talked about the mandible. But what we want to think about now is we want to think about what are those mouth parts being used for. Um, a large number of insects will have what we consider a sucking type of mouth part. And what they do with this mouth part is they sort of form a tube. And what they do is they pierce the tissue of both animals and plants. And over here on the right, it looks like we have an example down here to the lower left of a mosquito. And this would be a good example of a sucking mouth part because if you've ever been bitten by a mosquito before, of course their primary food is going to be your blood. And they need to gain access to that blood. And so they need to have the ability to pierce um, your skin. And you can see they've sort of identified the different mouth parts and kind of show you how they've been modified when compared to the um, example that we had used with the grasshopper a little bit earlier. You still have the same parts. You have the labrum, you have the mandible, you have the maxillae, and you have the labium. And if you notice the hypopharynx in this case is being identified. And as I had said, it's kind of um, hidden um, underneath some of these mouth parts we had talked about earlier. But the main function of this mouth part is simply to pierce and to suck the, the body fluids of its prey. Now houseflies and their cousins the blowflies, they have what we consider a sponging type of mouth part. And you can see those right over here. And again, we're still talking about the same parts. You can see the labial lobes right here. But they're a little, definitely a lot different from what you had seen in, in the mosquito on the left-hand side. Their main job is to sort of sponge up or to absorb food. All right, and so if you've ever had a fly land on you and you've watched it, you'll notice it continuously will take those mouth parts and sort of dab at the um, site where it landed. And what it's doing is it's actually feeding. Now, of course, there's a lot of insects out there that actually have biting mouth parts. And the grasshopper right here would be a really good example of those that have biting mouth parts. And you can recognize them because they have pretty significant mandibles. And the job of those mandibles would be to crush up the food that they are consuming. Now we're going to give you a really quick overview of the circulatory system, the respiratory system, and the excretory system that you would find in insects. When it comes down to the circulatory system, we're talking about an animal that has what we consider a tubular heart. And you can see the heart right through here in this grasshopper. And of course it's going to be found in the pericardial cavity. So we have a special area and that's going to be right through here that you're going to find this heart. And its main job, as you would find in any other heart, is to move the blood. And in this case the blood is being represented by the hemolymph. And it's going to move that hemolymph forward through the dorsal aorta. And you can see the aorta right here. And the heart itself is going to beat in what we would consider a peristaltic 
wave. And so what you need to think about there is when you think about the wave, for example, maybe at a, an athletic event where um, maybe somebody starts up a wave, that's what you're going to see in regards to how this heart is going to beat. It's not going to be a simple relax and contract type of beating. It's going to move throughout the entire length of the animal. Now in regards to the um, respiratory system, gas exchange is going to be very similar to what we've looked at in the um, arachnids and for a few crustaceans that we had looked at in chapter 20. Uh, they have what we consider a tracheal system and remember the trachea are simply a series of very thin walled tubes that are going to branch throughout the insect's body. And over here you can see these um, thin walled tubes being represented both in the abdominal region and of course in the mid region uh, of the animal, so that thorax region. And you can see sort of a blown up view of those trachea right through here. Now in order to um, gain access to these trachea, we have those openings that we had looked at before called spiracles. And the spiracles are represented by these very tiny holes that you would find in the abdominal region, which in fact actually has seven to eight depending on the type of insect. So there's a good number of access to these trachea. And you will find two of those in the thorax region of the animal also. Now, when it comes down to excretion, insects and spiders, like we had said before, are going to utilize malpighian tubules in conjunction with those rectal glands that we had talked about earlier. So there's going to be two things these um, organs are going to be used for. One of them, of course, is to remove waste. And in this case, that waste is going to be in the form of uric acid. The second is going to be that ion balance that we have talked about previously um, before with other groups of animals. In other words, we need to be able to maintain the water balance, the amount of water on the inside versus the amount of water on the outside. So the nervous system of these animals is going to resemble that of the larger crustaceans that we had looked at back in chapter 20. Um, the sense organs are going to be varied depending on the type of um, insect that you're looking at, but we've kind of grouped them into different categories. And the first one is those sense organs that function in mechanoreception. And what that means is we have a sense organ that will respond to touch, might respond to pressure, could be even the vibrations that are felt in the environment. And a lot of times these types of um, sensations are going to be detected by the sensile that you would find on these animals. And you can see an example of the sensile right here. Now if it's an auditory type of reception, we're going to again talk about a structure we've, we've seen in the past called setae. And sometimes they'll be called the hair sensile. And you can see those right over here on the um, right hand side. And so you can see sort of these very tiny hairs. So this, those would be the setae. And they're going to be used to detect airborne sounds. But if you have insects that don't have these sensitive setae, you might have an insect that has something called a tympanal organ. And you're going to be able to see these in the um, grasshoppers you guys will look at in lab. And you can see this tympanal organ right here. And so that's going to be used to pick up that type of um, auditory stimuli that you would find in the environment. So in addition to um, the auditory and the mechanoreception we looked at in the previous um, screen, we also have um, sense organs that will function in chemoreception. And these are usually bundles of sensory cell processes located in sensory pits. Kind of similar to what we had looked at with the nematodes way back at the beginning of second quarter. And they're going to be found among the appendages you would see on these animals. Now these chemoreceptive organs are going to be used when it comes to feeding, comes to mating, maybe finding a mate, habitat selection, and host parasite relationships. And so all of these things that we see listed here would need sort of a, a type of sense organ that can pick up maybe hormones within the environment that pretty much tell the animal, you know, it's time to mate. This is where you're going to find a good source of food. There's going to be the um, animal that I can use as a host if you tend to be a parasitic type of insect. Um, visual reception is going to be pretty acute when you talk about insects. There are going to be two types of eyes. Uh, we have simple and compound. So remember, compound eyes means an eye that has many lenses. The simple tends to be um, maybe just a sort of a, like an eye spot that would simply be there to maybe pick up um, whether it's light or dark in the environment. So those simple eyes that I just mentioned oftentimes will be called ocelli. And they're really only there to determine or detect the intensity of the light in the environment. So they really don't form images. Now the compound eyes, on the other hand, will contain thousands of very special structures called omatidia. So these are going to be the structures, and you can see them located right here, 
that actually will be used to form very rudimentary, oftentimes very fuzzy, what we consider uh, myopic images. So the very last thing that we need to do is we need to look at the metamorphosis and growth in this particular class. And so these animals oftentimes will have some um, pretty interesting um, reproductive strategies. And so what we do is we actually place them into three groups. The first one is called a metabolis, and what we do is we call that more simply just simply a direct type of a development. And we looked at direct development in previous groups that we've studied um, before today. And what that means is that the young that are born, the young that are hatched, are very similar to the adults. And really the only difference is the size of the animal and of course the sexual maturation of that animal. And so right over here, this would be a good example of um, an insect that goes through an ametabolous or direct type of development. Again, once it hatches from the egg, you can notice there's really simply only an increase in size of the animal. Now, we do have a group called the hemimetabolous or incomplete metamorphosis group. And in this case, we do have young that are called nymphs. And you can see the nymphs right over here. And this basically means you have animals or, or young that have what we consider bud-like growth in the early instars. And this is going to show you where the wings would be, but they don't really get wings until the adult stage. And so we have the egg, we have the nymph, and we have what we consider the adult. And the third category is a group that goes through a complete metamorphosis, and this is called holometabolis. So the larvae and the adults are very different from each other. Um, a butterfly, for example, um, if you look at the larvae, if you look at the caterpillar of a butterfly, very different from what you would see in the adult form. So right over here, this would be a good example of a holometabolis life cycle. So we start with the egg. Um, the larvae oftentimes sort of looks like a worm, um, so it's very different from what you would see in the adult form. And oftentimes one of the final stages before it transitions into that adult form will include a pupa stage. And a pupa stage is basically a, a stage where the animal sort of prepares or changes into that adult form. Sometimes people will refer to this sort of as the, um, the stage where you would see the um, creation of a cocoon. Um, it's really not a cocoon because what you have here is you have this larvae form actually shedding its outer layer or its exoskeleton and becoming sort of this rather nondescript pupa. But inside is where all the activity is happening. So you have a rearrangement of those body parts. Then, of course, eventually that pupa will break open and the adult will emerge. Now, what's really interesting about the holometabolous metamorphosis form is that it allows the animal really not to have any competition between the larval forms and the adult forms. So it's very beneficial to both um, groups during the um, reproductive process. Okay, so that's going to finish up our screencast. Please, again, make sure that you complete both of your study guides before you come to class on Tuesday.